Olga, how are you? Hi, Matt. I'm, I'm doing good. How are you? Well, uh, a bit like you, I'm um, trying to avoid the rain and the grey and the cold of, of British weather, but <laughs> there we go, <laughs> there we go. Hey, well, we, we caught up the WNA um, back in September with uh, Brandon Monroe at Bannerman Energy. He had a really good talk about what, you know, what was going on with that, out of that conference. I think today we're going to talk about a couple of other conferences which have happened since then, which are really important in the calendar. But might be worth you giving a bit of background uh, for people listening to this, perhaps didn't get to uh, cast that show in September. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yes, thank you, Matt. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. And um, yeah, it's my second time here. So I I joined uh, Bannerman uh, in June this year, and I came to Bannerman from the World Nuclear Association, where I was responsible for the well, the clear fuel report, and we'll probably chat a little bit around uh, that. Uh, and before that, I worked um, in uh, Tenix, responsible for sales of uh, uranium product uh, to North America and South America. And before that, I worked in Russia presentation office of Arriva at that time. And uh, it was the nuclear renaissance, and uh, we were responsible for the uh, finding partnership and cooperation between Arriva and Rosa. At that time. Can you imagine? Uh, it was back in 2009. 2009, okay. This is when I joined uh, the nuclear industry. Well, yeah, and, and a lot has happened uh, since then. Uh, we, we, we saw the renaissance and then we, we saw the capitulation uh, and hopefully we're, we're in a new renaissance now. So um, I look forward to um, hearing, getting your insights about some aspects of the market which perhaps people don't get to hear firsthand from people who have you know, been there and work, working in it um, about. But I tell you what, um, I kind of highlighted at the beginning of the conversation we met at WNA in, in London. We'll talk about the nuclear fuel report, uh, good read, good bedside reading. Um, but there have been a couple of quite significant conferences since then. I mean, um, I think that the first one was NEI hosted um, the annual International Uranium Fuel Seminar in Charlotte. Why don't we kick off with that? Who was there? What did they go there for? Yes, uh, definitely World Nuclear Association Symposium was uh, or is uh, the major event or uh, nuclear industry event uh, of the year. But uh, we working in the front uh, end of the nuclear fuel cycle, I, I personally consider two of the most important events for us is um, WNFC conference uh, in April. Uh, and this year it took uh, place in The Hague in, in April 2023. And of course, October uh, Conference International Uranium Fuel Seminar organized by um, Nuclear Energy Institute. This time uh, it took place uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and of course, uh, this event is largely US focused. However, we can't speak just about US focused. Uh, because all major suppliers always present there. Uh, and why this event is very much interesting for the suppliers is because that they nearly, if not all, the U.S. utilities do present all the time there. Because um, lots of the U.S. utilities, uh, they can't travel to um, outside of the U.S. and it's difficult for them to participate in the international uh, events abroad. Uh, and uh, normally just a few uh, U.S. utilities travel outside of uh, the U.S., uh, the, the largest and uh, the largest U.S. utilities. But of course, we as suppliers, we want to talk with uh, all market participants. And besides uh, utilities and fuel suppliers, of course, there are traders and investors uh, who are present there. Uh, this time, uh, the conference was quite... Uh, big in terms of uh, uh, participation. Uh, it gathered more than uh, 200 uh, participants. Uh, and, uh, the, and of course, uh, the conference was very interesting. And uh, my first uh, WNFC conference uh, was in 2012. So since then, I, I started participating in uh, the events. And like we touched at the beginning, Lots uh, has uh, uh, have changed uh, since since that time because there was uh, the 
massive uh, development. Then the, the market was down. And of course, uh, recent years, it was um, quite tough to attend those events. And uh, not only attend, but also organize. As, as you probably know, uh, while working in the World Players Association, I was responsible for organizing the WNFC conference. And we did it together with, uh, of course, our partner and organization, Nuclear Energy Institute. Uh, and um, in the years 2016, 17, 18, 19, the hardest thing for us was uh, to bring the interesting content and interesting speakers. And obviously, it is ex it was extremely ho uh, difficult because uh, um, nothing was really happening in the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, no, neither in uh, uranium conversion enrichment. Fuel fabrication was a little bit uh, more active with the accidental earth fuel and these developments. But overall, it was too quiet, if I may say so. And, uh, and uh, contrast to that, starting from WNFC conference uh, in April, then uh, reiterated by WNA symposium and uh, um, de definitely seen uh, during October week uh, in uh, Charlotte, there is very, very different uh, uh, aspiration uh, we currently see in these conferences, uh, it's a lot of vibe going on, a lot of uh, developments, talks, uh, reviving interest towards uh, the nuclear industry overall and nuclear fuel cycle, of course. And uh, there is a lot of development and you obviously see that in terms of uh, um, uh, speakers and participation, and even their behavior, how they sit on the scene, you know, on the stage, and how they talk. They're more relaxed. Uh, they they have what to talk about, uh, and uh, it's very interesting. And uh, of course, it's very positive and uh, um, um, very pleasant and rewarding to attend uh, uh, these uh, these kind of events when the industry is growing. Well, well, absolutely. You, you know, so obviously everyone went there with a, you know, their own agenda. Um, lots of content, as you say, but the mood. And I, 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 I kind of smiled when you were talking about the the physical positioning and posture of some of the people because it's true, isn't there? There's a bit of a a, a jump in the in the step uh, because the, the 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 optimism was palpable. Is, is you know that, that people are feeling this is actually a good place to be for the first time for a long time. Um, so, so let's let's talk about some of the, the, the different types of people. Obviously, the utilities were there. Um, and what, what, what do you think they, apart from presenting, what did they get out of it? Were, were they there to get information? Or were they there to project information into, into the uh, conference? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, the, the conference... Um... The, the, the most important thing, both in WNFC and in the AI conference, is that uh, the, the, these conferences are gathering together fuel suppliers and fuel buyers. So these conferences, they're not about R&D or technical stuff, or whatever, it's pure commercial, right? And the most important thing is to provide uh, the, um, for the supplies to provide the outlook and prospects of the development of the nuclear industry and potential for growth and so on. So that's why we always try to organize uh, the session so-called demand and explain how the demand can potentially develop, uh, grow or not grow when it was five years ago, right? But nowadays it's obviously growing with lots of programs. Uh, on nuclear development, uh, lifetime accession of the existing fleet, and so on. Uh, so, because the fuel suppliers, when when they listen to these talks, they can estimate and they can strategic strategically think about the development and how the development of their fuel supply capacities could evolve uh, over the years. And uh, the alternatively, uh, uh, for the fuel buyers. Of course, it's interesting to see what's happening with the current expectation on the fuel supplies. Uh, when we look at the uranium market, what's going on with the existing major supplies and uh, how potentially the 
um, potential or, or juniors uh, can uh, uh, develop or what they're expecting, when they're expecting to start, what capacity will be, what ramp up will be, and so on and so forth. And this time, for example, uh, one of the sessions was uh, particularly focused on uh, the junior minds development. Uh, so, yes, of course, and, and why this conference is very important for the utilities and in particular for the U.S. utilities because it's specially organized for them, right? So uh, the conference is bringing supplies from all over the world and giving the insights of how the supply picture will be developing throughout the entire fuel cycle. Uh, this time there were no, um, there were small uh, short discussions uh, on fuel fabrication uh, but the majority of talks were largely focused, of course, in the uranium development uh, and also uh, enrichment and conversion market. And um, we can uh, specifically uh, stop on this matter because uh, uh, this this uh, part or stage uh, or these two stages of the nuclear fuel cycle are um, very, very intensely developed and there is lots of going on. There were uh, lots of pieces of news coming uh, from uh, from the supplies uh, uh, starting from July and in particular in Toba. And uh, yes, if you're interested, we can talk uh, about that. Oh, for in sure. Well, let's do that. Let's talk about yeah. the conversion and enrichment component, um, Africa. I got, got through a couple, a couple of things. So, so what, what, what I'm hearing is that yeah, obviously, everyone's delighted that nuclear is back on the agenda as a kind of um, power supplier. Base load supplier is a phrase which is being applied to nuclear after many years of being, again, cast out into the wilderness. So that's good. Everyone's excited about that one. But obviously, there's a ma major concern here about where is it all going to come from? You know, the junior suppliers need incentivizing in terms of a price point on on term contracts um utilities need to understand who can genuinely deliver uranium in into the market i'm going to stick with uranium here right like i said we'll, we'll come back to conversion and enrichment in a second um who's going to be able to supply yellow cake and a, and a tin it to to market so the, was there a uh, was there? You said that obviously, you know, companies like Bannerman and, 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 and others attending here, wanting to have conversations, or yeah, you know, having arranged to have conversations with the with the buyers. Is how how much was um, were the utilities looking to seek to understand who's real and, and, and who's not? That's that that is very good question uh, because uh, uh, what is currently important uh, for the market, and we have recently seen this situation now with uh, Niger, for example, right? Because uh, there were a couple of mines, and one probably the most the, the most prominent mine that was expected to come online um, as as early in the beginning in in the beginning of 2025, and potentially with the coup uh, in Niger, this uh, this situation uh, can be uh, changed slightly or at least postponed, and that was already announced. And, and of course, uh, when, when utilities, uh, so in the current times when the security of uh, the supplies, uh, not in just uranium, but throughout the entire fuel cycle is the major question for all utilities. And utilities are largely rethinking and reevaluating re their purchasing uh, policies, right, their inventory policies and so on. So it is, uh, uh, so this year, 2022, 2023, they, they, these are quite disruptive years for the, through the entire front end uh, uh, nuclear cycle. And uh, that's why the security of supply is crucial for utilities. Uh, and uh, they they face these potential issues that are brought in terms of security supply, not just from juniors, but from the major suppliers as well. And we've seen this announcement uh, from all major suppliers, from Kazat and Prom. They, they experienced one issue maybe with deliveries. We've seen um, uh, the announcement from Cameco about uh, um, some small shortage of uh, supply in 2023. We, we obviously have seen uh, the uh, difficulties with the supplies from Niger 
Nirvana and all major suppliers who again with Gazatomprom are of course affected by the deliveries and the issues with the de deliveries, no matter uh, who the suppliers are, uh, and uh, potential um, uh, difficult or cut cuts uh, of uh, the supplies from from Russia or Russian origin fuel. So everything is affecting and. Uh, in, in, in this slide, of course, uh, it, it's more crucial and more critical for the utilities to look at the junior or potential junior supplies. What I've seen uh, from talking from the uh, utilities, they're obviously interested in more supplies, in more diversif diversity of uh, in supplies. So they, they're looking for more supplies because they, they're obviously talking, we are not interested just to have uh, three supplies. We want more supplies on the market and they're ready to support uh, juniors with the offtake contracts and uh, forward-looking contracts and so on and so forth. And, and they're looking forward uh, for the uh, junior uh, miners to, to come and to, to start producing. Uh, and of course, you, you know, for the utilities, it is uh, not a simple, simple question and not an easy question. And uh, they will, of course, uh, uh, they, they will uh, carry out a due diligence and they will see and because they, they, should, they must be sure uh, and certain that what is uh, announced by the junior producer will be eventually implemented and the supplies will come are uh, in time right there so there are techni uh, some techniques of uh, 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 cont contractual within contracts how to secure in case something happens that of course no one wants uh, this uh, this uh, delays potential delays uh, to ever happen right and that's why of course utilities are closely looking uh, at uh, the the near term or mid term junior mining companies so that are expected to come online. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting one around, around contracting because you know, Mr. Former Banker, I'm, I'm looking at how secure those contracts are. If there's a lot of opt outs for the buyer, the utility, I'm I'm a little bit nervous because it says to me that you jealous. It says, I think this company will be able to produce, but I'm not sure it's no. going to be able to produce. So therefore, I'm going to want a slightly looser, more flexible sort of contract. So, you know, those those term contracts are, or, or, or offtakes aren't necessarily uh, a guarantee of being able to access um, bank finance, certainly not on the debt, maybe a little bit looser on, on, the, on the equity side. But um, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to sort of see yeah, as, as the market you know, evolves as some of these, you know, advanced developers, you know, move their projects through the phases, you know, how they get judged by industry and then the finan the financiers, um, and then ultimately, I guess, that the, the market um, for, for, for sure. Um, just in terms of, we, we, I'm just conscious, we've we better, we better move on. Um, let's, let's talk about the second um, conference, which is a big, this is a really, really big one, because I know you, you guys were there, Bannerman was there, you were invited to this one, and it's one of the big geopolitical 800-pound gorillas in the room, which, which is China. So tell us about that. Uh, right. In, in fact, it was the first uh, international forum on natural uranium, uh, and uh, this uh, this conference uh, was uh, co organized uh, by CNNC uh, and, uh, um, and several other Chinese uh, associations and organizations. Uh, and um, well, uh, it, it was quite a surprise, right? Because uh, we we received this invitation uh, quite recently, maybe a couple of uh, maybe a month, couple of months ago, and it was quite uh, a very quick decision on our side. But uh, we decided to to go there, and uh, uh, and, and uh, there was not a second of regret. Because uh, first of all, it was um, extremely well organized, and I'm looking uh, at, at this conference, of course, uh, also from the uh, angle of the um, conference organizer, uh, and it was extremely high level. Everything was prepared and uh, and done on a very high level, 
And of course, the main purpose of uh, that conference, it was just first conference, right? But I'm pretty much sure uh, it will be annual conference from now on. Uh, and, uh, and of course, speaking about China as the um, key driver, if, if you wish, uh, for the global nuclear industry with uh, the, uh, the, the ambitions uh, that uh, were announced and with the plans that were announced. So currently, uh, China is the largest uh, builder of the nuclear power plants and uh, uh, it has uh, 55 operable reactors and 25 uh, reactors on, uh, under construction. And uh, of course, uh, they're, they're very ambitious plans uh, for the construction up to 2030 and 2040. Uh, so, um, and, and uh, when we speak about uh, uranium requirements uh, for China, it is uh, the most uh, critical for them, obviously, because uh, there, re there are probably no concerns, uh, or most likely there are no concerns in terms of uh, conversion capacity or enrichment capacity or fuel fabrication capacity. They, they have technology and they are able to uh, install and uh, um, uh, increase the capacity as much as needed. However, when we when they're speaking about when we are speaking about uh, uranium requirements, uranium demand, of course, the uh, efforts that China is uh, putting in terms of uh, both developing uh, the domestic uh, uranium uh, capacity. Uh, having having done all exploration and um, development of existing mines and so on and so forth, uh, so domestically and also um, you know, outside of China, yeah. So there are lots of interest China currently has uh, all over the world and uh, developing more. And uh, when we're looking at uh, Africa, for example, we've seen that uh, at this conference. Uh, all major suppliers, of course, were uh, present, and uh, uh, the the potential junior suppliers and existing suppliers mining uh, or expecting to mine in Africa, all of them were invited, uh, and we of course see uh, quite close uh, interest uh, from China towards this continent and towards the development ongoing uh, in uranium mines uh, uh, in Africa from from China. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it, it's, it's, I think that was fascinating. Because obviously, I think um, Africa has always been the breadbasket for China, uh, for all commodities, all, 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 all metals uh, across the board. But obviously, um, they've been very, and they're, and they're very pr um, present um, in, in Namibia, where you guys are, are, are based. And I think that they've got, uh, um, let's see. They like the they like the thought of Niger as as, as well. Shall we, shall we say? Yes, sure. um, <laughs> the 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 thing that's kind of interesting about this is they're not, you know, hiding hiding. They, this is the first international forum that 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 they've done. They're they're interested to open um, themselves up to the world in terms of maybe some of the potential supply routes, which they're going to need to capture. And they and because of the way that the government is entwined with some of these state run um, companies, the CNC, CNNC, um, for instance, they feel that they're going to be kind of quicker off the blocks than the West, which is going through the phases. It's going through the phases. So so again, I, I guess my question was, um, you're invited there to kind of see what they're about. Were they interested in seeing what you guys were about? Were they? Was it kind of like Charlotte in the sense that it was, they were kind of keen to see who were the more, more advanced stories and you know maybe start conversations relationships uh, well of course uh, china is like i like i said before uh china is closely looking uh and is it's not just uh, in africa it's uh, it's in well, the so the country is looking in projects in mongolia in kazakhstan in canada all over the world in africa of course and, and uh, uh well um they're talking to to anyone they can, they can talk obviously and uh, when when we're speaking uh why they're doing this uh, yes so just quick calculation based on the fuel reports you probably know that uh, uh the the global uranium requirements so the global ones uh, uh nowadays is roughly 65,000 tons uh, of uranium 
Uh, and if we look at uh, prospects that uh, China may need or requirements that China may need, according to the upper scenario, the fuel report, uh, in 2040, 65,000 tons of uranium will be required just by China only. So you can imagine this scale. Uh, and, uh, and and we, we, we can expect that China is talking to anyone they, uh, they can talk and who is open to talk to China. So there is no surprise, and there is not a no hidden agenda here. No, 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 no hidden agenda, and uh, I think everyone understands where, where the where the money resides. I think that that's the, what people's expectations of African projects are: um, is that China is, you know, would 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 like would like to um, be working with with those um, types yeah. of companies in those sorts and, of countries for for sure. Yes, and we also see it uh, not just from uh, junior, the, the interest towards junior mines. mines. Yeah, uh, you have recently seen the announcement made by Kazakhstan, Kazatom, yep. Kameko, right? So we have seen, for example, monitoring the uh, uh, Chinese uh, inventories. You know that uh, China has strategic uranium inventory, and we have recently seen the um, slowdown of uh, uranium imports. But with all those announcements uh, made quite recently, there is, of course, an expectation that probably there will be again ramping up of those deliveries uh, of uh, uranium from abroad, um, both to satisfy the needs of the existing fleet and also to uh, fill in uh, more inventories. Okay. Well, look, I, I, I think I'd like to move on to the kind of um, the enrichment side of, of, of the conversation in terms of getting this entire fuel cycle um, into this conversation. But we, what, what's your you know one thought off the back of what you heard and saw in Charlotte, what you heard and saw in Beijing? You'd say for uranium juniors, junior mi miners, and it more more especially, like, well across, across the world, what what would you say that the the, the one thought is this? It's a, di it's a different environment, clearly, but we, what, what uh, did you take away? Uh, so, once again, do you want to, to speak about junior uranium miners or enrichment and conversion? Just, just on um, junior uranium first, you know, what, what's the takeaway for them? Can they gain comfort from those, those two conferences? Um, and and if, if so, what would what would you urge the investors of those companies to be aware of? Uh, well, well, yes, of course. So first of all, um, the the major takeaway from from the, those two conferences, and uh, in particular from the uh, NAI Uranium uh, seminar, that uh, utilities are very much open to talk, and utilities are seeking for the developments, and they're eager to. Uh, diversify their portfolios and to talk to new suppliers. So I think this is very encouraging. Um, I do, um, on the on on one this is on one hand. On the other hand, the situation is not simple. The situation is not simple either for utilities uh, because uh, the the price development is quite shocking for them, right? And they potentially they they I I talked with uh, some utilities and. Uh, uh, they they say oh no we are not happy we're not ready to pay uh, this price uh, the, this uh, price uh, now but on the other hand uh, and this is my strong uh, uh, um, belief uh, that uh, the prices will probably be volatile a little bit but they will not go down so uh, I I heard from previous conversations you had that take uranium as it is, because then the prices will only grow. And, and of course, uh, there is a pressure from the markets, there is pressure from the demand, because look how many uh, nuclear programs, uh, like we discussed already, uh, have been recently announced from all over the world. Uh, and uh, just United States alone, even without uh, maybe new constructions currently announced, uh, the, the just lifetime extension of the Entire uh, U.S. nuclear fleet will be there. It will bring lots of continuous uh, demand and continuous uh, and sustainable uranium requirements, right? And uh, and of course with the small programs, uh, look uh, all those announcements that uh, the countries that are currently just building and starting their first reactors, like Turkey, like Egypt, they 
uh, United Arab Emirates, they have already announced that they want more reactors. Poland and, and so on, Sweden, Canada is going to build more. Italy is considering. Who can imagine that uh, a year ago that inter Italy will be seriously considering uh, a nuclear program? So uh, definitely the situation is changing and uh, definitely the prices won't uh, go down for sure. Uh, on the other hand, for the junior companies, it is also a difficult situation because um, the uh, the junior mining companies should uh, choose the right moment to start contracting and start um, uh, produ production as well. So it is um, uh, it is very interesting timing, definitely positive, uh, maybe not so positive for utilities, but positive for utilities from the prospect of the supply diversity for sure. Well, that, that's yeah. There's a, there's a nice po positive ending there, but I don't think anyone ever wants to pay higher prices. But at the end of the day, I think we're moving quite rapidly into seller's market. And if you want it, you're going to have to pay market price because I, I think uh, scarcity uh, will define wh where this price goes. I agree with you. Maybe a bit of volatility along the way, but it's you know higher lows, higher highs, and that's all good news for Uranium Genius. Well, look, let's just let's, let's kind of jump into the world of, of um, enrichment. We we we, go, we kind of got to cover the whole um, conversion and enrichment discussion because it, it, you know we need to understand the whole fuel cycle and, and where that's going. So, well, maybe give us a little overview of you know um, you know where where we are because you know we we've seen obviously Russia Ukraine situation has meant that. People have suddenly realized that, oh, Russia is supplying 40% of our enriched uranium. Um, we want to sanction them, but I don't think we can because we, we won't be able to access any enriched uranium or, or, of our own. We saw White House you know, a couple of weeks ago issuing um, a request for $2.2 billion to kind of advance their own enrichment uh, capabilities. So it's complicated out there. Where are we now? Where's it got to go? Yeah. Well, uh, this is a very good question, and this is really the question I, I'm very interested to, to talk about and to explain a little bit the concerns, right? Because uh, there are definitely no concerns about the uranium supplies, though uh, there, is, uh, um, there is a common understanding that it takes uh, 8 to 15 years for a uranium mine to, to start uh, from exploration to, to the production. So it's quite a long time. However, uh, during this, uh, this, this time when the uranium market was down for quite a long time, the, uh, the industry has accumulated quite a good pool of potential junior companies uh, coming. So there are no concerns about uranium supplies or maybe not larger concerns. However, however when we look at the conversion market, and enrichment market, there is also there, there is obviously huge concern happening uh, from in in these uh, in these two stages of the front end nuclear fuel cycle, and uh, and uh, I'm I'm happy to explain why if uh, there is such an interest. So first Absol of all, absolutely, I would like, please do. Uh, yes, uh, from from all the sessions that I have attended in Charlotte, the uh, most interesting for me. Uh, was uh, the, se the session um, on conversion and enrichment uh, when uh, uh, the uh, when NEI managed to gather uh, all major converters and suppliers. So it was uh, Conradine and Cameco uh, representing conversion. Uh, there was the Uranka and Orana, and of course Orana representing conversion as well. But uh, they, they mainly mainly talked about uh, enrichment. And uh, two uh, potential uh, enrichment suppliers, uh, which is Centros and Geely. So it was very interesting session, and uh, uh, I think uh, and 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 you know when I look at uh, uh, these guys, I'm so happy for them because uh, uh, there was uh, for, for ages uh, there was nothing happening there, and uh, uh, it was uh, quite a depressed situation on the market when Converdine was closed for six years and there was no production there, and they finally restarted uh, the um, uh, the Metropolis facility uh, in in summer this year, uh, and um, 
uh, and uh, and also uh, there were recent announcements uh, both from Urenco and Orana about capacity increase, and these are very good signs uh, uh, for for the markets overall in general. Why? Uh, because uh, we we definitely know that um, the deliveries of uh, um, enriched uranium products. Uh, you you can say why whether it is just uh, SWO or uh, enrichment or it is a uh, um, completed product like EUP where where there is uh, enrichment component conversion component uh, together uh, or all three components enrichment conversion and uranium together so and and uh, and of course uh, the um, the deliveries uh, from Russia take uh, uh, quite a big portion of the market. There is quite a big share um, uh, that uh, uh, Russian uh, conversion and uh, enrichment supplies occupy uh, worldwide. And uh, currently, with the with the whole uh, situation with the war uh, in Ukraine, obviously there is uh, a big issue and a big concern happening. So this happened in 2022 when some utilities uh, 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 implemented so-called self-sanctioning, when uh, uh, the utilities uh, just uh, decided not to extend, uh, not to go into new contracts uh, with uh, uh, with the and not to deliver new uh, supplies from uh, material of Russian origin. Uh, and also, uh, there is, of course, uh, currently the consideration of the potential sanctions against uh, the deliveries from Russia in the United States. So, as you correctly said, these uh, deliveries are very important, and uh, we don't know whether or not uh, these uh, sanctions will be at all uh, agreed and implemented. However, uh, there is obviously a great concern about the security of supply of wool because uh, these deliveries can be disrupted by whatever, uh, either by the uh, maritime deliveries uh, from Russia, uh, transportation issues, or uh, or maybe the uh, the decision from Russia when the Russia will stop. Uh, uh, supplies of of this uranium, and and I think it's very interesting to uh, so first of all these are very very positive pieces of news uh, when Urenka and Jorana announced uh, the uh, increase in capacity, and I can provide just a few numbers to explain why this issue is crucial and why why this issue is very important and why these announcements are very important. So if we look for example. And I will base probably on on the field report. I think this is very good uh, publication, uh, and uh, I want to take this opportunity and to explain a few facts. First of all, I would like to stress uh, that sometimes uh, the conclusions that um, are uh, are given in the field reports are wrongly interpreted, uh, and in particular, when we look at the uh, conversion capacity and um, uh, enrichment capacity uh, from China, yeah, because China is listed there. I, I don't know if you have ever seen uh, this, these tables, uh, but uh, all those who have a uh, field report uh, in front of uh, you, ah, great. <laughs> I can even refer to the pages uh, if you wish. <laughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely. But, yeah. So if we look at the conversion capacity, it's page 171. And there is very good table where we accumulated uh, all the uh, conversion capacity, yep. uh, and it's it's very important to explain the methodology for the Chinese conversion capacity and vice versa. If you look at uh, page one hundred and eighty-five, uh, there is uh, the same methodology used for the enrichment conversion capacity from China. So because uh, the Chinese market is not very transparent to us. And we don't really know the uh, existing capacity, conversion capacity, or uh, enrichment capacity. The methodology that was used for the field report was based on the self-sufficiency. And this is very important to say, because 
when I see sometimes some analysts are using and saying this is the capacity uh, in China, existing in China, and will be in China. It is, it is not the case. It is the estimate that this capacity will be needed to satisfy domestic conversion and enrichment requirements. So if we, if we have a very uh, simple calculations uh, of the uh, conversion and enrichment, excluding China and excluding Russia, and just calculate uh, the Western conversion and enrichment capacity, we can have, uh, let's say, for 2030, right? Why I'm taking the year 2030 is because uh, uh, both uh, Orana and Urenka should be able to uh, uh, implement their increased capacity, ramp, ramp it up, and supply the, the full uh, scale capacity that, that was announced. So if we look uh, at the global conversion demand, and of course, when I calculated the conversion demand, I excluded, so everyone is now talking about bifurcated markets, right? So I excluded the Russian influenced or the countries where the Russia is definitely delivering. So such as uh, Armenia, Belarus, uh, uh, if we look uh, at the pr prominent reactors, uh, Bangladesh, uh, potentially Uzbekistan, depending on the scenario and so on, uh, um, maybe Hungary as well. Uh, then conversion demand in 2030 will be roughly about 40 44,000 tons uh, as U6. And if I calculate based on this table, uh, the conversion potential capacity in 2030, it will be roughly 35,000 tons. Uh, and uh, you see there is uh, quite uh, an undersupply. However, it's worth mentioning that in 2030, there is an expectation that uh, Westinghouse will uh, start uh, the Springfields uh, conversion capacity in the UK, which should uh, be able to start in 2028 and potentially by 2030 it will be w uh, working full scale. Uh, and, and of course, currently we, 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 so we can potentially say that there will be some supplies coming from Russia, right? So we can say that um, conversions, yeah, so still when we are looking at the conversion supply versus demand, it is quite uh, in, in, in undersupply, right? But if we look at the situation in 2023, uh, we can say that the conversion demand is 43,000 tons versus the conversion supply roughly 22,000 tons. So it's huge undersupply. No. So this is real Even bottleneck. And that's why market is really looking at this uh, at, at this stage of the fuel cycle. Absolutely. So we're going to need a lot more money invested. Like obviously, Arano um, announced that they the the board had approved 1.7 billion euros worth of funding to in, you know increase the um, Tricastin site by 30 percent, right? So the equivalent of what 2.5 million swoops, right? You've got, um, obviously, Urenco talking about the New Mexico site increasing that by 15%. It's good, but we need more. <laughs> it's, it's, yep. You know, China, self-sufficient, one would imagine, and that they'll be, as you say, it's hard to get information out of there, but you imagine they are doing things to make sure that they will be self-sufficient. Um, the Russia, China, Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakhstan prom, conversations of the last three, four months would suggest that that production's heading east. Um, the West has got a, their issues are going to be around, where do I get uranium supply? How do I convert it? How do I enrich it? It takes time to ramp up. It takes time to build new. Um, do you think it's a bit, what we call the UK a squeaky bum time. It's a little bit uh, t tight. Um, in terms of will we be able to convert and enrich enough for the demands that we're going to have within the build time frame? So, I mean, how, do, how does the market feel? How does the West feel about, about that? I mean, have you heard or read any conversations around that? 
Uh, it's a very good question. I will comment on that. I just want to uh, maybe once again underline the numbers that I, I have just given. They were about conversion, not enrichment. So I can yep. speak about uh, enrichment as well. Uh, and yep. uh, maybe uh, again, coming back just, just to finish uh, my, my uh, sentiment, in 2023, of course, there is huge undersupply, but it is not that bad at present because we still have inventories, we still have uh, uh, uninterrupted deliveries from Russia. So this situation is not that bad, but it can be threatening if these deliveries will stop. It can be also threat threatening if the, the, the inventories will continue to decrease. And there was very good presentation done by UFC at the International Uranium Conference, speaking that to the inventories, and in particular, the inventories in the uh, UFC at SWOOS are quite decreasing. You know, they, they're quite at, at a low level currently. But if this situation will go on as it is, business as usual, then we are safe, right? The, the, the deliveries from Russia are still ongoing. And though, even though there were some delays with the deliveries, no delivery failed so far. So it's all good. Yeah. Why yeah. there is a close look at this part of the market? Because potentially these deliveries can be cut off. There can be various reasons for that. And that's why the utilities are quite stressed about that and they're quite you know, uh, closely looking at this uh, at this uh, market. And when we look at uh, the enrichment, answering to your question about uh, enrichment, the situation is probably more relaxed, not that tensed. Uh, and and but in particular with the announcements that uh, were, were just recently made. So if we look at the enrichment in 2030, Roughly, Western demand is the 36 uh, million source. Uh, and uh, if we look at the uh, potential uh, supply, including already those new capacities that will be brought uh, online by 2030, it's roughly 30 million source. So it is quite a good match. Uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, again, we should take into account, and these are not in these numbers, that GLE will come and will start production in 2028, uh, and Centrus will be probably ramping up and increasing their capacity. And of course, there is always a possibility for overfeeding for enrichment. However, this overfeeding again returns us back to the conversion capacity and uh, the, the needs for more uranium because overfeeding requires more fuel and still we are coming back to the conversion capacity uh, the expected undersupply either in current ne near very near term short term or in the future looking uh, into 2030 and potentially of course the conversion capacity will be needed uh, will will be it will be um, will need to be built expanded. Okay. There are possibilities. Like I said, there is Springfield. Potentially, uh, Convertine uh, can potentially double their production because if you remember backwards, there was 15,000 tons produced at Convertine. But um, we don't know uh, what exactly it is and how the situation will look like. So, look, so I, guess, I guess that's good news in terms of the, in terms of the confidence of, of the industry players that this will work itself out. I'm just wondering around price, though. Is it a case of we're going to, we talked about volatility around pricing here, but do you, do you feel that this is going to be a, a, a smooth ride in terms of the actual supply demand fundamentals? Because supply is reliant on the, uh, you know, being able to access funding, being able to actually, you know, get it delivered on time, you know, and, and how, how do you, how do utilities read that situation, I, I wonder? Well, broadly speaking about um, um, the nuclear, fu nuclear fuel broadly for, uh, for the utility, uh, it is a very small portion in their expenditures. So uh, it is roughly 4 or 5% in overall expenditures uh, that uh, nuclear utility has. 
So it is very, very tiny pot. Uh, and even if we are speaking about real drastical price increase, it will still be quite a tiny pot in the expenses. So uh, definitely uh, there is, there is uh, well, my feeling and my aspiration that yes, it will be probably not the pleasant situation, uh, but we have already seen those uh, uh, spikes uh, in, uh, in price increase uh, and uh, we have overcome this twice already. So potentially it can be a new price, quite high price increase uh, in the uh, some midterm, near, to, near term. We don't know how and well, because uh, it is, I think, uh, analysts probably can uh, project it and forecast that, but I think there are too many uh, disruptions currently going on and very unpredictable uh, disruptions uh, uh, could come and uh, could happen. Uh, and it is very difficult to uh, say to what extent the price will go either uranium or conversion or enrichment. But if you see, if you if you look, for example, at uh, conversion prices, let's say in 2017, uh, when Converstein uh, closed uh, the uh, Metropolis uh, facility, the price uh, for uh, per uh, kilogram of uh, uh, U6 was roughly seven dollar, and now it's 40, 41. So uh, it is nearly, yeah, um, yeah. It, I think it was even down to four. So if we look at four versus 40, 10 times higher. So it can happen. Yeah. We'll see how it can happen. How, how much yeah. it will be, how high it will be. Well, I, I, I suspect we've, as, as ever, it remains a very exciting space to be uh, working in, investing in. Uh, it feels like it's still got a, long way to run and a few twists and turns along along the way but uh, long way this price um uh, gain uh happen we, we, that's the bit most of the shareholders are interested that most shareholders most investors are interested in but i need to thank you olga today really insightful i've learned a lot this uh, there's quite a bit you said there which i haven't i haven't actually appreciated so um please come on again soon please invite me i'll be happy to talk again <laughs>